Well, I have a confession to make. Last night I was laying in bed and I was checking out England. Obviously not much going on there right now, but take a look at it about 12 hours ago. And man, look at that wind. The uh, black feathers are gonna be the sustained winds and the red markings give you the gusts. Now take a look at earlier in the evening about 2Z, 50 knot gusts showing up there. Now it's not possible to go above 50 knot gusts with this particular color scheme because obviously it's gonna crowd your other feathers. But we can click on the station and see that they were up to 56 knots, which is going to be about 62 or 63 miles an hour. And it's not just them, but multiple stations, like right down here, I guess that's Cardiff. I'm not really sure of my Welsh cities, but as the evening goes on, around 8Z, the morning commute time, widespread 45 knot gusts across the country. And remember last night, we talked about that in detail, that fast moving system crossing the British Isles. Do we have any fast moving systems like that here at home? Well, not really. We've got this big bowling ball cut off low over California, but it's just taking its sweet time moving out. We've had that front hung up there in New Mexico, Colorado for at least a couple of days now. And it's not really going anywhere because most of the cold air is flowing up to the northeast, kind of parallel to that boundary. And there just has not been a good, strong wave to really pick up that front, cause baroclinic development, and move it on eastward. So what we have this evening, we've got this uh, jet stream pattern running about like that couple of branches up across the Great Lakes and the main jet max looks to be rotating around the base of that trough. The main cutoff low, the center of that vortex, sitting right there over San Francisco. So what we're going to see over the next day or two is that trough finally opening up and lifting to the east-northeast. Well, it's not quite opened up by Saturday and Sunday, but it is barreling eastward. And that's bringing the strong wind field out into West Texas. There it is right there. So strong forcing, cold conditions aloft. That's going to mean convection and very likely linear modes. And this is a split flow pattern. See that jet right there? And there's a jet further north up there in Canada. So we're going to kind of focus on the southern stream here. Most of that strong energy coming out into West Texas. You can see the tight packing of the height contours right there, indicating the stronger jet energy going across the Big Bend late on Saturday. So probably Saturday night into Sunday morning will be active in the southern plains. Going into Sunday, looks like the flow remains channeled. There's the jet right there, and the jet max is kind of spread up and down that jet axis kind of longitudinally there. And we see that the energy mostly heads up into the Midwest, Iowa, Missouri there. And if we kind of use that rule of thumb with a trough right there in the downstream ridge and the location of the jet itself, that's going to put the Bear Clinic Zone right there over Arkansas. Late on Sunday, cold front running about like that with the warm front somewhat eastward towards Tennessee. So obviously our system is lifting eastward. And in Texas, we're getting some of the dry slot right there, as well as the cutoff flow itself. And when we have this closed vortex like this in the spring, often there tends to be shallow convection with peak heating. So if we can get temperatures to warm up there in the Texas Panhandle, there's a possibility for some low top convection. And that's what the soundings look like. And obviously we do have dry adiabatic lapse rates, some good instability there. So if we can get any heating down through there, there should be a few good cells, maybe a few hailers. We'll have to check on that maybe tomorrow. And then going forward, 
well, that cutoff flow just is not opening up. It's getting there, but it's moving up to the Great Lakes, and it looks like it may be starting to enter the northern stream. There it is right there. Yeah, so it's opened up by midweek. Then we have that second system coming into California, and this has a very strongly defined advection lobe, so very strong vertical motion fields associated with this on Sunday going into Monday. So it looks like that's going to enter the picture in Northwest California. Yeah, that's going to be overnight Sunday into Monday, and then spreading eastward during the day on Monday. And then we'll be contending with that somewhere on the Great Plains around Tuesday. Well, we'd better take a look at that surface analysis. Looks very similar to what we had yesterday. The northern portion, though, has moved quickly to the east. Yesterday, we had it right there around Minneapolis, where we had some storms going. The front extended down into Nebraska and over to Colorado. Well, it looks like that's moved eastward about 400 miles or so, but the tail end is about in the same place as what we had yesterday. Looks like maybe it's just east of El Paso. However, I was able to pick out a frontal wave there in New Mexico around Roswell. And with the front making some progress southward, that shifted the triple point south from Kansas down into the Vernon Knox City area. And the dry line extending south from that towards Sanderson and Ozona. There's our surface chart at this hour for Oklahoma and Texas. This is down at the mesoscale. And let's just run through this quickly. Cold front extending from McAllister down through Wichita Falls over to north of Plainview. Looks like it's right through the Turkey, Texas area. And then over to Tucumcari. And then it extends maybe up towards Raton, kind of like that. And the dry line, well, that's pretty well defined. See the 24 dew point at Plainview, 22 at Lubbock, and 57 at Abilene. So obviously, the division between the moist tropical air and the dry continental air, right along the Cap Rock, about like that. And that puts a triple point just south of Childress. So very likely any low clouds north of the front, Hobart, Oklahoma City, Tulsa, that's going to be associated with that cool air, isentropic lift. The stuff south of there is going to be associated with the feed of tropical moisture coming up from the Gulf. I'm not sure what we're going to see to the west, so let's check it out on the satellite picture. And there we go. There's the satellite picture. Lots of mid and high cloud. So subtropical moisture, definitely a factor today, and that's going to cut down a bit on surface heating. What we do see, tropical moisture flowing northward through East Texas, mostly along and east of I-35. And then further to the west, I can see a few cloud bands indicating tropical moisture, but it really trails off as you go to the west. Where the triple point is, let me move that up there. That triple point is going to be right in that area south of Childress. And yeah, just not any low cloud field at all. The tropical moisture we would associate with that triple point, storm development, all of that, just not much going on at all. So things still appear moisture starved. And there's the moisture setup on the high resolution rapid refresh. What we want to see is this darker cyan color kind of bunched up like that, just kind of heading northward like what you see down in this region here. We don't have that. It looks really eroded, like somebody took a piece of sandpaper and just scratched off the moisture off all this area. And looking at the soundings, say right around Knox City in that area, kind of looks that way. Instead of the moisture holding its ground with height, it's actually dropping from 58 to about 46 degrees Fahrenheit at the top of the moist layer. Now, the moisture is deep, about 7,000 feet deep there, but it is just not the kind of quality that we want to see on a day like this. Now, the other factor, of course, the cap right there, it is a little bit strong for this kind of moisture pattern. And 
lapse rates are not that great, but they are starting to steepen up, especially in the 700 through 500 millibar range. So speaking of lapse rates steepening up, well, the big thing that would contribute to that is cooling at 500 millibars at the top of that little layer that I just showed you. So we're going to click on this 500 millibar temperature product. A lot of 500 millibar charts tend to be winds and that kind of thing, but we're going to look at temperature. So starting out, let me bring up the values. You can do that by clicking on this interactive features, bringing up cursor readout, and we can see that the values at 500 millibars are running about minus 14 across the South Plains. But lurking off to the west, much cooler temperatures, you can see that blue there indicating minus 20. So let's see how things run through going into Friday. Wow, yeah, that trough is approaching from the west. By Friday evening, we're starting to bring minus 16 into New Mexico. See if we can bring up the sounding in that area. We should see steeper lapse rates. So, yeah, it's steepening up. And let's see what happens going into Saturday. Well, now the trough is really rolling in. That's minus 30, roughly minus 30 Celsius aloft. And I'm going to put that right on that division of like around minus 20. And you can look at those mid-level lapse rates. So they're certainly steepening up. And back in here, where we've got the white colors, yeah, that's almost dry debatic. So if we can roll that out over a layer where there's strong moisture in the mid-levels, we're going to have high capes and high instability. So, well, that blob of cold air is definitely heading northeast. It's kind of hard to see the juxtaposition of that with the moisture, but one cheat sheet we can look at, of course, is the cape. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up most unstable cape. So starting out this evening, modest values across Oklahoma, and you can see out there near the triple point, instabilities are just not that great due to the limited moisture out over the cap rock. Now running forward into Friday, overnight, instability increases there in West Texas with the moisture advection heading up in that area overnight. And then as we get the heating coming in tomorrow, those capes really build along the cap rock. So looks like some chances of storms there anywhere from Childress down to Midland. And then Saturday, that's going to be when the cold temperatures at 500 millibars roll out. And that's where it's happening right there, Texas Panhandle. The problem is when we roll out this strong instability, it has a tendency to also punch dry air eastward. So probably what's happening is it's shunting the moisture to the east, and it's making it hard for that upper level cold pocket and the very moist air in the low levels to really get into phase. So not much help there with instability, but it does gradually move eastward. And looks like maybe some stuff on the tail end around Monday. But I was surprised to see on Sunday, going back there, just not much instability to be found. Although here, that looks like maybe some cold core instability action. And then, of course, what we all want to see, the precip. Let's uh, check that out. Let's roll that forward. Into tonight, we know that there's going to be moisture advection in the West Texas, warm advection. That's all going to result in lift, and we're probably going to see some elevated showers overnight in the Lubbock area. Then tomorrow, a little bit of a break, and then we get the heating. And, of course, we know that there's probably going to be convection along the cap rock. This model suggesting stuff around Childress down to Guthrie, but looks like some widespread development all the way down the dry line, all the way down to Fort Stockton. So the character of these cells, I'm going to back this up just a little bit and look at the hodograph in skew T. Well, looks weakly capped, so numerous cells, lots of clusters going up. Looks to be 
not that unstable due to the limitations with moisture still continuing. You can see the capes are not that high. And the other issue is unidirectional flow. All these plots on the photograph kind of linear. Maybe a little bit of helicity down on the lower levels, but overall this indicates a lot of seeding of the cells especially with the northeast-southwest orientation of that dry line. So, kind of looks like a grungy day to me, although you would still see a little bit of action out there. And then when the dynamics come out on Saturday, looks like a lot of forcing. Early on during the day around noon, GFS going for a line of convection right there, continuing to build that into the Childress area. So, it looks like a couple of days of rain there. And then it's going for stronger convection during the evening, but we know that instability is going to be a little bit limited. Now, going back to that upper level chart, you can see that the big bowling ball of cold air is still way out to the west. So we're only benefiting from this decrease in the temperature aloft right there. And it's not really rolling out until after dark. So... That can be a good thing. That can be a bad thing. For one thing, there's not as much heavy forcing along that dry line along the triple point. So Saturday could certainly have some action there. But going into Sunday, that bowling ball of cold air does roll out into the plains. But you can see that westerly flow has pushed the moisture off to the east. So again, the pros and cons... The cons, not as much instability. The pros, uh, we're not getting steamrolled with forcing. So possibly some good, a few good thunderstorms on Saturday and then Sunday. I think we saw that the instability was going to be kind of limited. And just taking a quick gander there at the soundings. Yeah, look at that. Just moist adiabatic lapse rates and the capes in the doghouse. Okay, Daddy, you get the stick, you get your elbow. That's a pretty good deal. And that's all we have for this edition of Forecast Lab. I appreciate your support and your viewership. And hopefully we'll see you all once again tomorrow for the Friday edition. Have a great one. Bye-bye.